सहना बवतु सहनाओ भुनक्तु सहवीयम करवावहै तेजस्विनावधीतमस्तु मा विद्विशावहै ओम शांति 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 हे हरि ओम एंड गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रॉम नायगर फॉल्स दिस मॉर्निंग um, Acharya Maduji, my mother and I, we came to the ashram together. And I was thinking about my mother and father, that they completed their Vedanta studies formally from Siddhabari, and they've been back in North America for a year. So I was asking my mother, what has made you most happy the past year, the change in your life, and what has made you the least happy the past year, the change in your life? And my mother was sharing that when the mind gets agitated, whether one goes in a vid, through a Vedanta course or not, the mind gets agitated. When the mind gets agitated, that she likes to read our scriptures. And then the agitation gets resolved because, because one realizes one's more than the mind, that these are, uh, this is worldliness that is agitating us. And she was saying that with the birth of Vyasa, my son, and the birth of my niece, Misha, that she hasn't had as much time to study the scriptures and she wants to come back to that as the babies grow older. This is exactly the need for shastras or scriptures in our lives. When we are agitated, we don't know what to do and we tend to look to others who are as agitated, if not more agitated, than us. And we pat each other on the back saying, it's okay. But the agitation comes back again the next day and the next day. So really, is the agitation okay? Do you feel stronger? Do you feel happier? We are taking up the scripture of Ramayana or this is the ayana of Rama, or the ayana to Rama. Ayana means path. Ayana means road. So Ramayana is the path that Rama took. This is where Bhagavan Rama traversed. And that's nice as a kata, but if we want to understand the depth of this, it is not the ayana of Rama, it is the ayana to Rama. This is the path to Rama. And we've studied that Rama means joy. I didn't say pleasure. Pleasure comes from a coffee. Pleasure comes from the sun. Pleasure comes from sleeping in. But joy is not accessible outside of oneself. So we call this course Vedanta in Ramayana. Ayana to Rama, the path to joy. And this path is Vedanta. Veda means to know, antaha, that which is inside. To know that which is inside is to know that really there is no you and I, there is only Bhagavan Rama. There is no pleasure, there is only joy. Unconsciously, we already know this unconsciously. Every one of us, from the time we were born to the time we will die, we are trying to become more and more and more independently joyous. 
We are trying to become the person who is not shaken by worldliness. If you choose to sleep in, why did you do it? You did it to become more happy. If you got up to go for a jog, why did you do it? For happiness. If you're paying attention, for happiness. If you're distracted, for happiness. We do this unconsciously. And through our course, we're trying to make this subconscious. We're trying to make this conscious. Because only when we know that Rama is us, that Rama, that Ramayana is taking us to become more inward looking, only when we know can we benefit. If we don't know, we can't benefit. And I've given you examples of this. If you're driving from Buffalo and you're going to Toronto and you drive through Niagara Falls, Canada, but you don't know you're here, do you stop to check out Niagara Falls then? You don't know, so you can't benefit from this wonder of the world, yes? This knowledge in a worldly way brings so much benefit. Imagine in a divine way, knowing that I am joy, how independent one would become. And so this is not just an idea. When it comes to studying Vedanta, you always have to approach an idea from three different perspectives. These perspectives are Shruti, Yukti, and Anubhuti. Shruti is, what do the Shastras, what do the scriptures say about this idea? In our stairwell here at Chinmayadhara, how many of you have been to Chinmayadhara by show of hands? You all need to come here. We just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. Uh, so come. When you get to the first um, landing in our stairs, there's a simple sign. You can hardly notice it. It says, Tat Tvam Asi. And when you get to the second landing, which is the top floor where we are, it says, Aham Brahmasmi. That Tvam part, tat tvam asi, tat, that, tvam, you, asi, are, that tat is joy. That sign from the Upanishads is saying, you are joy. And if you follow Ramayana, you'll get to the second landing, and it won't be you are joy, joy it will be I am joy. So no doubt, the Shastras or Shruti say, yes, your nature is joy. Now let's think of this logically, okay, from a rationale perspective, from a yuktis perspective. When you feel content, what do you do? When you feel content, when you feel happy, what do you do? You smile. Treat others happily. Yes, that's why we're all so mean to each other. <laughs> and we don't do anything, right? When you're content, you don't do anything because doing will take you away from that contentment. You just be. In fact, if you're at Niagara Falls and you're seeing this thundering waters and you're feeling so content, don't you close your eyes to internalize that even more? So rationally, when you're unhappy, we do so many things. And when we're happy, we do nothing. Doesn't that show that happiness is most natural? That happiness is your nature. So Shruti is saying you are happiness. Yukti is saying you are happiness. Now we go to Anubhuti or experience. When do you have the least masks on? When do you wear the least amount of masks? And I don't just mean facial masks. When are we most vulnerable, most innocent? When you're by yourself and even when you're by yourself? When you're about to go to sleep and when you're about to wake up. So you are by yourself. That's when we really are tuned into who we are. When we are 
sleeping, there is nothingness. There is no Niagara Falls, there is no gender, there is no Ramayana. And in sleep, we feel at ease. We feel no burden of the body, no burden of the mind. It's who we are. And when we wake up from that, those weights start to come on. I have to do this. This person's going to say this. And on and on and on. And then we just keep playing that game. I put on more masks and more masks and more masks. And when we go to our rooms by ourselves, when we take these masks off, we feel much lighter, isn't it? So experientially, when there is nothingness, no worldliness, that is when we are most content. So even experience is telling us that we are happiness, we are independent joy. We've forgotten this. We've forgotten our path. It is through Bhagavan's grace that we have an opportunity to be part of this course. Okay? Everyone's flowing with me? I was sharing how Ramayana is the path to Rama. And this path is really said differently as Vedanta, knowledge of within. And the scriptures and rationale and experience is teaching us that Rama is inside of me, Rama is me. Now we begin our review of what we've studied so far. Goswamiji begins his Ramayana by remembering Bhagavan. And he is not casual in his remembering of Bhagavan, in his invocations at all. Remember so many <laughs> invocation shlokas that we studied, so much of an introduction before the katha even began. And I'd like to highlight that the whole vision of Ramayana is actually contained in the first shloka. And you know this shloka, you can chant this with me if you know this. Varna nam artha sanghanam rasanam chanda samapi mangalanam chakartarao vandevani vinayakao. Where Goswamiji is saying the purpose of anything, here he references language, the purpose of anything is to get to vani. Who is Vani? Mother Saraswati, knowledge. And Vani will lead you to Vinayaka. What does Vinaya mean? Humility. We say Vidya Dadati Vinaya. Knowledge will lead us to humility. And you don't go somewhere for humility. I was looking for a rad to post, a reflection adventure of the day. And there's a quote from Anna Kendrick, I think that's her name. And she says, I'm so humble, I'm like the Kanye West of humility. <laughs> Kanye West is the least humble, <laughs> the least humble person in, in entertainment. But isn't it funny that some people will say, you know, my strongest virtue is I'm, I'm humble. See, see how they've externalized that humility, which means you can't be humble. Humility is within yourself. So the vision of Ramayana is to um, be aware of knowledge, that Veda part, and then Antaha is that humility, okay? Not casual about these prayers, which is very different than us, isn't it? How many of you chant Brahmarpanam before you eat a meal? How many of you chant Brahmarpanam? When you're really hungry, how fast do you chant Brahmarpanam? <laughs> Correct? Or just quickly, Shiva, and you start eating. Or you just remember it, <laughs> and you start eating. But Goswamiji is not casual about all of this. After invoking Bhagavan, he goes on to share why Brahman takes Avatara as Bhagavan Vishnu and why Bhagavan Vishnu takes Avatara as Bhagavan Rama. What does avatara mean? Avatarati. Tarati means to cross. Avatarati means to cross down. In other words, to descend. 
It doesn't mean to fall. One of Bhagavan Krishna's names is Achyuta, the one who's never fallen. Avatara means to descend. In other words, that Bhagavan goes from expressing his infinitude to expressing that infinitude in a more controlled way so we can relate to him. And if you take this subjectively, avatara should be in here, correct? I should know that I'm Rama. That's when Bhagavan Rama truly takes avatara. So Goswamiji explains all of the reasons why Bhagavan Rama has come to be with us. And he initiates these reasons by discussing Jaya and Vijaya. And Jaya and Vijaya are bhaktas. They love Bhagavan. But there is a moment of forgetfulness. And in that moment of forgetfulness, they fell. And how lovely that they fell and then Bhagavan descended to catch them. Isn't it? It's like if Vyasa were on this stage and he was about to fall, I would fall first just so I could cushion his fall. Yes? How beautifully Bhagavan shows that. And Jay and Vijaya, they fell three times. How many times did Bhagavan Vishnu incarnate? Four times. Just so in case there's any record-keeping errors, <laughs> he fell again. Like in banking, right? If you have to transfer a certain amount of money, you put a little bit of extra money in case there's some fees and so on. So Bhagavan came four times. And this shows that Bhagavan will do anything for anyone, keyword being any, as long as we are bhaktas. And sometimes he'll do this in a positive way, like praladha, how he held praladha in his lap, Sometimes he'll do this in a negative way. He also put Hiranya Kashipu in his lap too, correct? But Praladi protected Hiranya Kashipu. He, he um, not protected, I'm looking for another word. Not even rehabilitated. <laughs> That's a nice word. He rehabilitated uh, Hiranya Kashipu. So, like, we are with our kids. Sometimes we have to be stern with them, sometimes gentle. But in both cases, you're looking out for your kids, yes? Goswamiji invokes Bhagavan. Bhagavan says, yes, I will come for you, Goswamiji. I will come for you, Cleveland. I will come for you, Vivek. And then he is born. And when he's born, he plays and plays and plays. And what is the Sanskrit word for playing in Bhagavan's case? Leela, Shishu Leela. He plays as a toddler. He plays as a youth. He plays as a young adult. And within this playing, what was one of our most favorite parts of Ramayana that we've studied? When he gets married. Yes? <laughs> That's part of Bhagavan's play also. You don't think Mother Sita happened to be there. She happened to accidentally be there when <laughs> Bhagavan Rama was in that garden. This is part of their play. And now I'm, I can feel some of you. You're coming here with your, with your intellect. I don't understand this incarnation. I don't understand this word Leela. To truly appreciate Ramayana, you have to see, you have to feel this Leela. And I'll give you an example of that. Last night, uh, Pandit Jasraj had sung for Chinmay Mission Pittsburgh. We had a fundraiser for Chinmay Mission Pittsburgh. So I was there listening to Panditji and, and speaking also. And he's very strong in Hindi. He sings Hindustani classical music. So he was explaining in Hindi the import of a bhajan. Because there was many non-Hindi speakers there too. And in this one bhajan, he was saying that Balarama is with his friends and Lord Krishna is there too. And Balarama is telling Lord Krishna that, you know, you're so dark. You're Shama. And our mother, Yashodra, she's so fair. She's fair like me. You're adopted. <laughs> Balarama is telling Lord Krishna that you're adopted. <laughs> 
And Lord Krishna is feeling so bad about this, that, you know, that I, I'm adopted. So he goes to Mother Yashoda and says, you know, am I adopted? And she says, D you ignore everyone, you are my son. And as Pandit Jasraj was explaining this, he couldn't continue because he was crying so much. You know? And that's why it's hard for me to say he, he's in, in Hindustani classical singing. He's a bhakta. He sees Bhagavan Krishna. He feels Bhagavan Krishna. So he can appreciate this, this Leela, no? And so if we feel very intellectual, that's like a perfectionist thinking that's a strength. It's not. Bhagavan Rama is married. Bhagavan Rama comes back to Ayodhya. And then Mantara reasserts herself. She was already there, but she comes to the forefront. And we know how Mantara, which is that Dusanga, converts Keike's mind to become negative. That Bharata should become the king that Rama should be exiled for 14 years. And all of that joy that was built up comes crashing down that everyone in Ayodhya had left with Bhagavan Rama. And now we've only gotten into the first third of Ayodhya Kanda. You will find that Ramayana moves in waves. Balakanda up, Ayodhya Kanda down. And it'll just keep on moving like this. And the reason for these waves is because this is like our life, isn't it? We can all relate to this. Imagine Bhagavan Rama's life was perfect from start to end. Would we be able to relate to that? We find difficulty in relating even to the Upanishad, which is why Upanishad takes on a different name and form as Bhagavad Gita, no? We can all relate to, Abhima, um, to Arjuna, Abhimanyu much more. So Ramayana will go in waves. So try to relate to this. We had a very interesting conversation about artificial intelligence at Bhiksha yesterday. That could artificial intelligence be created in such a way that they could emote like Pandit Jasraj. You know, when he was crying, so many other people paused also. Would we be able to create a robot? to do that. And the conclusion we came up with was no. Because artificial intelligence would not be able to empathize with someone like us. You know, my son Vyasa, as he learns to walk, he's going to fall so many times, and then he's going to finally learn how to walk. And when if he has a child, he'll be able to empathize with that child. But a robot may never fall, yes? How will they be able to empathize with falling, with a broken heart, with, this is just, Balarama is being sarcastic with Lord Krishna. I love how Ramayana and our scriptures are really driven through empathy. This leads us to the final scene that we studied where Sri Lakshma, Mother Sita, Bhagavan Rama, are with Sumandra. Sumandra is Raja Dashrata's minister. And Raja Dashrata told Sumandra, you stay with Bhagavan Rama, with Sri Lakshmana, with Mother Sita, and you bring them back. You show them the forest symbolically and bring them back. And then Raja Dashrata ended this dialogue saying, I know Rama and Lakshmana will not come back. But you bring back Sita. What will her father say? that she's come to my kingdom and now she's living in the forest. So Sumantra is discussing with Mother Sita saying, you know, Raja Dashta said if they stay, they stay, but you should come. And Mother Sita is not an, she's not a, someone you can just walk over. She's not succumbing to compromise. She replies, responds to Sumantra saying, Rama is pleasure. Rama is possession. Rama is position. What will I get in Ayodhya? In Ayodhya, Ayodhya, there will be pleasure, right? She'll sleep in a nice bed. There will be possessions. She can have people who help, help her. She'll be the next queen. But if Rama is not there, who is peace, 
What is the point of all of that? So she knew, and that's a message for all of us. What is the point of pleasure, possession, position if there's no peace? And if there's peace, you have much more of pleasure, possession, position. And as Sumantra hears this, he's crying because the one instruction that Raja Dashrata gave him, he was an, unable to do that either. So he gets onto the chariot and he starts riding towards Ayodhya. But every so often he just keeps turning those horses around to go back to Rama. And, but, then, but then he realizes he needs to go back. And this just keeps happening. Keeps happening. Bhagavan Rama, Mother Sita, Sri Lakshmana, and Guha then meet Kevat. Kevat the boatman. And there's a wonderful dialogue that we finished with where Bhagavan Rama's in a rush. He needs to go to the forest. <laughs> and Kevat said, what rush? What rush are you in? You're here for 14 years. What are you rushing for? <laughs> and the deeper meaning there is that Bhagavan Rama wants to see his bhaktas. And Kevat says, you know, your, the dust of your feet have transformed a rock into a woman. The dust of your feet will transform my boat into a rock. How will I have my income? <laughs> so they have this very innocent dialogue. They have this wonderful, um, clean fun that's going on. And finally, Bhagavan Rama says, you can wash my feet. And Kevat washes his feet and then takes him across to the other side. And how thoughtfully that you and I need a nauka in life, correct? To cross over maya. We need bhava nauka. We need help to realize ourselves. Even Bhagavan Rama needed a boat, correct? If Bhagavan needs a boat, but here we come and say, I can do this myself. Bhagavan studied in the Gurukula, but here we are saying, I can just use YouTube. <laughs> I can use the internet. How carefully this has all been created. And when Bhagavan Rama is taken to the other side, he looks to Kevat and says, now I have to pay you your fee. And Kevat is stunned, saying, you allowed me to wash your feet. You allowed me to serve you. And you're asking me what fee I want. And all he asks for is, may my mind never swerve from you. When you have peace, what do any of the lower peas mean? And Swami Tejumayananda had shared about this dialogue that the manifestation of punya is being able to engage in seva. See Kevat's punya that came out that he got to serve Bhagavan Rama. And that's for all of us to think about too. When your punya, when your merits come to manifest, you will have opportunities to serve. And if you don't have opportunities to serve, not enough punya, or the punya is too, it needs to be ripened more. Yesterday, in Cleveland, we had a meeting on Saturday morning, and uh, there is a, a, a devotee that would like to donate land in Cleveland for our ashram. How amazing is that, that we've just started three and a quarter years and already someone would like to help us build our ashram. And afterwards, then some of our committee members and I were chatting and we were thinking, what would we be doing on Saturday morning if we didn't have Chinmay Mission in Cleveland? We would have ate more on Friday, slept more on Saturday, watched television. How that punya is coming to manifest that there are opportunities to practice tapa. So many of you are in the Atma Bodha class, correct? The first word of Atma Bodha is tapaha, discipline. So here Kevat's Punya comes to manifest. One more point to share about this whole experience is that Kevat uses Mother Ganga to wash Bhagavan Rama's feet, yes? So Guha is so happy, Kevat so happy, Mother Ganga is so happy too because she found her source. Because where does the Mother Ganga start from? Haripada. From Bhagwan Vishnu's toe to Bhagwan Shiva's head to us. 
You know, it's like being lost and then you find your home. How happy you would be. This is why in Bharat, two very auspicious cities are called Kashi and Uttarakashi. In both of those cities, you'll see the Ganga is not flowing towards the Bay of Bengal. It's moving back to the Himalayas. In Uttarakashi, it turns back and then goes, and then in Kashi too. So whenever knowledge is not extrovert, but it's introvert towards the source, in our culture, that is an auspicious place. So here, Mother Ganga also feels so happy that she got to reunite with her source because Bhagavan Vishnu's feet is there. This is what we've studied over a year. Everyone's feeling fine? Everyone is clear? Okay. We'll study one line to commence our forward study. I'm on page 327. This is the 123rd section of Chaupais, 123rd. I am reading the first and second sentence of the first line. The first and second sentence of the first line of Chopai 123. This is what Goswamiji shares. Age Ramula Kanubana Pache Tapasabesha Virajata Kache Ubhaya Beecha Sia Sohati Kese Brahma Jeeva Beecha Maya Jese. So Goswamiji is describing how Bhagavan Rama and Mother Sita and Sri Lakshman are walking. So he says, Age Rama and Piche Sri Lakshmana. And they're wearing Tapasa Vesha, that though this is the Lord of the universe and the field of the universe, that is Sri Lakshmana, but they're unrecognizable. And who's walking in the middle? Ubhaya? Mother Sita. And she is like... Brahma and Jiva, and so she becomes Maya. So there's lots of depth to just how they walk. So I'll share some of these details with you. From Keva taking them across to this present scene, what has happened? Every morning and every evening, what did Bhagavan Rama engage in? His puja is Sandhya Vandana, and he always would build a Shivalinga. It's said very specifically in Ramayana that Bhagavan Shiva would collect clay, make a Shivalinga, and worship that before he began his day and when he ended his day. And so for someone to come and say, I'm a Shaivite or I'm a Vaishnavite, you can only say that if you have little knowledge, correct? But if you know how Bhagavan Rama lived, can you say that? Not possible. They're best friends forever. And as in their travels, they reach what is now known as Alabhad, but originally known as Prayaga. And I think you should all start calling it Prayaga, not Alabhad. Prayaga is known as to be the greatest place of Yatra, Tirtha. Guruji described this as Prakrashta Yagaha Yatra. Prakrashta Yagaha Yatra, where the highest form of Yaga takes place, is Prayag. So Bhagavan Rama, who's actually higher than Prayaga, even he goes to Prayag, correct? So we have to go there too. If he goes there, then we definitely have to go there. And it's very nice what is shared in, in Ramayana. Do you all know where Kumbakonam is? Kumbakonam? Kumbakonam is in Tamil Nadu. They share that, and it's a holy place, if you commit a sin, if you make a mistake in Kumbakonam, then you have to go to Varanasi to purify that sin. And if you commit a sin in Varanasi, then you have to go to Prayag to uh, clear out that sin. And don't ask me if you commit <laughs> sins in, in Prayag. That is a place where all sins are to be washed. Bhagavan Rama continues and he meets Bharadwaj 
Rishi. Now, if you remember, how many dialogues are happening in Ramayana? Four. So many, but four specifically. One of those dialogues is happening with Bharadwaj. So here, Bhagavan Rama, who Bharadwaj Rishi is describing and listening to, actually comes to his ashram. And when he meets Bharadwaj Rishi, he asks Bharadwaj Rishi, what path should I take to go to where I need to go? So Bhagavan Rama, who knows all, is asking Bhardwaj Rishi, where should I go now? And Bhardwaj Rishi sends some of his students with him to take him further into the forest. And at one point, Guha is following him. But Bhagavan Rama asks Guha to go back. And you have to feel that, that Guha, who was one of the first people to meet Bhagavan Rama in the forest, and he's asked to go, back. Like the gopis, when Bhagavan Krishna said, go back. And Bhagavan Rama continued his journey and everywhere he went, old people, young people, girls, boys, rich, poor, everyone was so attracted to Bhagavan Rama, physically and more so personally. People would just hear about these two princes are here, the princess is here, and they would come running. Those people who were too old to run, they would just say, tell me, describe them to me. So much energy Bhagavan Rama exuded, and people were tuned into this. So now I'll tell you some of the Vedanta about this before we complete our class today. I was talking about Prayaga. And I said, Prayaga is the place you must go on in a yatra. What does yatra mean? Journey. Yatra comes from the root ya. Ya means to go. So yatra is a place where you go. But that's outside. The Vedanta part of this Ya doesn't mean to go, ya means to move. When you go to a yatra, you should be moved. You should be changed in the yatra and post yatra also. So do you really need to go to Prayag to be moved? Can you be sitting exactly where you are right now and be moved? You can. And you can be in Prayag and still not be moved, correct? So you spent all that money and took all of those pictures but never changed. Did you go on a yatra then? Went on a vacation. So here, ya means to, to move. Bhagavan Rama, when he meets Bharadwaj Rishi, he says to Bharadwaj Rishi, what can I do for you? When we meet pe people, we say, you know, can you do this, <laughs> do this for me? But Bhagavan Rama, who's a guest in the forest, says, what can I do for you? That's a nice reflection adventure of the week. Every time you meet someone, you should say, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? How can I help you? And when Bhagavan Rama says this to Bharadwaj Rishi, this is what Bharadwaj Rishi says. He says, until a man gets sincerely devoted to you in thought, word, and deed, he cannot even dream of happiness in spite of all his devices. Devices here means all of the pleasure, possession, position. So unless we are um, concentrating on Bhagavan, we can keep playing games in the world, but we will not be peaceful. What a prayer that this Rishi asks of Bhagavan. What would you ask for if Bhagavan said, I'll give you whatever you want. Change the president. End the hurricane. Let my kids be the best on Shadi.com. Whatever it is. But that will come and go. There'll be another hurricane. Hurricane Jose is coming. There'll be another president. There'll be another lifetime. But once you reach Bhagavan, Bhagavana, there is no other, isn't there? There's Bhagavan only. Only with knowledge can we have such love of Bhagavan. Without jnana, 
Bhagwan we will believe in, but we will not have faith in. I was in Boston in August, and I was discussing with a group of youth about atheists and theists. Should I ask all of you how many of you are atheists and theists? There's a, a joke about this. So an atheist, a cross trainer, and a vegan, they will all walk into a bar. <laughs> and the bartender says, I know, they already told me. In other words, atheists love to talk about how they're atheists. Vegans love to talk <laughs> about how they're vegans. Cross trainers love to talk about how they're running this race or that race. An atheist can never be as loving as a theist. Because a theist is someone who believes in that which is higher. That which is higher is infinite. An atheist doesn't believe in that which is higher, doesn't believe in infinity. So now tell me, who do you love the most? You love yourself the most. And if I believe in infinity, that means you and I are what? For an atheist, they also love themselves the most, but they don't think you and them are what? So an atheist can never truly love or care for another like a theist can. That's the importance of knowledge, to grow out of being an atheist and into a theist. When Bhagavan Rama asks Bharadwaj Rishi for where to go in this forest, how, what paths should I follow, who is he asking for? Because he doesn't know where to go. That forest is samsara. He's asking for the path through this forest, not for him. He's asking for us. Because with Bhagavan Rama, there's so many other people, correct? I had mentioned that. And now we're reading about this too. How thoughtfully Bhagavan Rama asks the Rishi, what are the ways out of samsara that we're stuck in? So it's not just a physical path. It is a sadhana. And I told you that Bhardwaj Rishi sends brahmacharis with Bhagavan Rama to show him the path. How many brahmacharis are sent? Four. What do those brahmacharis symbolize? The Veda. That the Veda will guide you along through being stuck. But at one point, the brahmacharis have to go back to the ashram. For us, you can't just keep studying the Veda. You have to start internalizing the Veda also. And what does the Veda teach it? Teach? It teaches dharma, doesn't it? That's why Guha was sent back. Because Guha is the chief of that village. He has to go back to his responsibilities. For us too, you can't just stay in this ashram forever. You have to drive. You have to go to work. You have to, what you learn here, you need to practice. So Guha is sent back. The brahmacharis are sent back. For us to internalize all of this. Throughout Bhagavan Rama's journeying, and I'll reference Srimad Bhagavatam here, it's shared in Srimad Bhagavatam that every insect that landed on Bhagavan Krishna was enlightened. Every person who touched Bhagavan Krishna, every person Bhagavan Krishna touched became enlightened. Every person who saw Bhagavan Krishna, every person who Bhagavan Krishna saw became enlightened. And that's why Bhagavan Rama is rushing to go to the forest so he can see more people. More people can touch him. So all of them can be free. Now I feel our Vedanta and Ramayana course, specifically the technological age, how great Zoom is. Maybe Bhagavan is reaching all of us, you know, seeing all of us, feeling all of us through all of this. No. Five years ago, would this opportunity have existed? There wouldn't have been classes in Morgantown. There wouldn't have been classes in Cleveland. That's why I said you have to see more carefully about Bhagavan Rama's presence to feel him. And this all leads us to Sri Lakshmana in the back, Mother Sita in the middle, and Bhagavan Rama in the front. Bhagavan Rama is Brahman, 
Mother Sita is Maya and Sri Lakshmana is the Jiva. Maya is not a problem as long as Maya is following Brahman. If you coming here, you reading the Shastras, which is all Maya, even the Guru Shishya Parampara is Maya, but as long as that Maya is looking to Brahman, it's called Vidya Maya. This Maya is leading you to Vidya. But if what you're doing is not looking at Brahman, it's called Avidya Maya. It doesn't lead you anywhere. It keeps you stuck in incompleteness. So here we're calling Mother Lakshmi Maya, Mother Sita Maya, but this is not, this is constructive, not destructive. And there's much more to share about this. One beautiful last thought is that as Bhagavan Rama was walking, Mother Sita would not step in his footprints. She had that much reverence for Bhagavan that she would not walk in his footprints. And if you think about this more deeply, can Maya touch Brahman? Cannot touch Brahman, isn't it? And Sri Lakshma, he was even more in a predicament. He couldn't walk in her footsteps or his footsteps. <laughs> so the Jiva can't touch Maya. Touch Maya for me. You can't do that. And you can't touch Brahman. You can only be Brahman. So Sri Lakshma was just jumping the whole, <laughs> the whole time because there were so many sets of footprints. There is more to share, which I will next week. Oh.